What's up everybody, Rob here. So, I finally managed to acquire software for screen capture. Um, stuff that people have been using for years now, I just managed to learn about the other day, and I'm just going to be testing it to get all the kinks out, and just really get a feel for how this thing works. And, in order to do that, I'm going to be analyzing the beach battle from the movie Troy, and it's the extended edition. So I've seen the original edition multiple times over. This is the um, extended director's cut edition or whatever it is they're calling it. In any case, so it's a little more expanded on from there. And um, yeah, just going to be giving my analysis to what I see and um, from a historical perspective, a pragmatic perspective, and just, you know, filmmaking and storytelling perspective. Just, you know, just whatever my impressions are. So we have here, we start out with the Greek fleet here, and I'm going to be referring to them as the Greeks and not the Achaeans. I know in the Iliad they refer to as such and not Greeks. Um, yeah, Greece would not become a unified nation for many, many millennia after this point, but okay. Just going to call them Greeks anyway because I feel like doing that. Uh, you got Achilles right here in his Myrmidons. You know, they're going to be spearheading the invasion, and you have the Trojans here ready to repulse them. Now, in the... Well, in the Trojan cycle, not in the Iliad. Uh, the Iliad, the war had already been going on for nine years at that point. But in the uh, Trojan cycle, there's no mention, at least none that I'm aware of, of the Trojans actually trying to repel the Greeks. And honestly, in order to repel an army of this size, you know, that the Greeks are landing here, you would need an equally large army. And if there was an equally large army uh, waiting for you on the beachhead while you're trying to unload your ships, you're very vulnerable at that point. The Greeks wouldn't have bothered. They just would have sailed off and landed, you know, a couple miles down. Um you know, down the beach a bit, you know, they just landed somewhere else. So this never really happened. No doubt this was inspired by Saving Private Ryan. So yeah, this is Bronze Age Omaha Beach. All right. So here we go. Marmadans. My brothers of the sword. I'd rather fight beside you than any army of thousands. Okay, I'm going to stop right here. I'm going to just be talking about the armor and equipment they got here. Um, first off, uh, they do have helmets. I got to commend them for that. Most movies, the heroes don't have helmets, and he doesn't have a helmet now, and these guys don't have helmets. But they will be putting helmets on, which I actually think is a good thing. Okay, yeah, they're they're putting on headgear, most important part of your body. You got to keep that protected. Uh, they are using very stylized-looking Corinthian-style helmets. Now, the Corinthian-style helmet wouldn't be invented for many centuries after this, really in the classical Greek period. Uh, that's when they would become popular. Um, the Mycenaean period, when this supposedly took place, you know, or whatever inspired the Trojan War, um, they would not have this particular type of helmet on them. Um, also, the faces are very exposed. These are very wide, open helmets, and... Um, yeah, uh, it just doesn't offer as much protection. Um, so, yeah, that's historically inaccurate there. They, they're very stylized-looking uh, Corinthian helms. Now, as far as the armor goes, they appear to be made out of leather. Um, was leather used as armor? I Well, there's a lot of debate on it. Some people say no, some say yes. The Mycenaeans might have, and it was probably made from goat hide. Uh, wouldn't be leather like this. But if you look at, um, you know, like the shoulders here, right, this is Lorica Segmentata. It looks like Lorica Segmentata, which was used by the Romans, I think, in the 1st or 2nd century AD. Several millennia, at least, you know, um, you know, 1,200, maybe, you know, 13, 1,400 years after this time period here. So, um, yeah, it, it, this is nothing even really Mycenaean or Greek. And there's really no point. If this is made out of leather, there's no point in making them segmented. The whole point of segmented armor plating like that on the Lorica Segmentata is that it's made out of steel. And uh, you need the, the metal plates are very difficult to, um, well, they're rigid. And so you need the plates to overlap each other so they would slide across one another and the person would actually be able to move properly. Leather is a very flexible material. There's simply no need. If you want to make leather armor, you would just make it one solid piece. Same thing here. You see like scales. Um, looks like leather scale armor. I've never seen any actual evidence of this sort of thing actually existing. And um, if it did exist, there's really, again, no point to it because um, this would, if there is scale armor, which you know did exist, it would be made from little pieces of metal plates and that would give the armor flexibility and allow for movement. Whereas um, here, if it's made out of leather, well, it's flexible enough. You really don't need to do it. Um, as far as the shields go, the shields actually, I do kind of like. Um, these are these, these figure eight shields. Um, yeah, with these, these cutaway notches, that actually is historically accurate. That's something the Mycenaeans absolutely did have. They would be much larger. They'd, they'd be large enough to cover pretty much a person's entire torso. 
So uh, you just kind of scrunch your head down a bit, and you're pretty much completely shielded from whatever it was that was thrown at you. Um, they'd be much, much larger than this. Um, but otherwise, the actual design, I have no problems with there. Also, I just want to point out, too, they have spears. Everybody's using spears, and they will be using spears throughout the scene and throughout the movie. Actually, it's something else I do commend uh, the movie for. The polearm, the spear, was the most popular weapon throughout history from you know, the beginning of civilization all the way through to if even into the modern day, if you consider a rifle with a bayonet on it to be a type of polearm. So, yeah, actually, I'm commending them for their use of the spear. And, of course, you have uh, forearm armor here, too, um, because for some reason people have the strange notion that in the ancient and medieval world, people always protected their forearms. Mm, yeah, okay. Oh, and I have no idea what Achilles is wearing here. You got bronze here, and you got leather in the middle here, and I, I just... I. I don't know what's going on here. Okay, moving on. Let no man forget how menacing we are. We are lions. Do you know what's there? Waiting. Beyond that beach. Immortality. Take it. It's yours. This guy here, he was, um, he's the second in command here under Achilles. And in 300, he's the second in command under King Leonidas. That is a very odd thing. Anytime there's a Greek epic, he's always the second in command. That's an incredibly odd thing to be typecast as. I mean, it's apparently working for him. So, hey, you know, good for you, man. But, um, yeah, just a really odd thing to be typecast um, as being. Okay, this bothered me when I first saw it in the movie theater. Um, back when I knew virtually nothing about ancient whatever warfare. And I, even this stuck out to me. He's holding it by the blade. You have a handle. The handle is right there. You can just hold while you're holding it in the middle of the blade. There's no point in doing that. Swords have handles for this. Their hand. Okay, I'm just going to stop now. Okay, you have the Trojans moving into place. Now, again, they probably wouldn't have opposed the invasion because, you know, they wouldn't have done that. But if, say you, they, okay, fine, they want to oppose the invasion, they want to be there. Okay, uh, if you'll notice up here, it's a very clear day. And if you notice from the opening shot right there uh, at the beginning, um, they saw the Greek fleet coming in from miles away. Rowboats and sailboats that the Greeks were using, they don't move very quickly. And um, as you're going to see later in the movie, uh, Troy is not that far away. It's like a leisurely stroll away from you. So if you are going to oppose it, they had plenty of time. Okay, you had plenty of time to get into position. You shouldn't have, you know, wait. It's like they're waiting to the last possible minute and then running into, you know, into position. Uh, like, like these guys here, they're um, they're heavily armored and they got heavy equipment. They're going to be halfway tired by the time they get to, you know, get to the battle zone, and they're all going to be exhausted and, you know. Already at the disadvantage there. Uh, you got the archers here. Um, they're wearing zero armor whatsoever. They, they have these headbands on, which I don't know what that's going to protect against. Uh, there's no, I, I don't get it. But of course you got the forearm armor because, okay. If your bow creaks like that, I'd suggest getting a new bow. Enough commentary has been done about fire arrows. I'm not going to add to it, Just, but just know that uh, no, no fire arrows. Okay, now right here, um, you have the Myrmidons there um, under... Fire and now you don't fire. I know you don't fire an arrow. You shoot an arrow, but whatever. Um, they're but they're under you know this attack from the archers, long range. You already had a couple of them get hit, and um, they're jumping off the side of the boat. Okay, um, they do have ramp technology. In I know this is a primitive time, especially compared to our modern advanced technology. But a ramp is really not that hard. You just take a plank of wood, you, you lay it off the side, you know, put it off the side, and then you can stroll down. See. They're, they're going to be forming up. I'm sure most of you have seen this movie. Um, they're going to be forming up something very similar to a Roman Testudo, and that pr pretty much makes them impervious to archer fire. So what you can do is already be in that formation on the boat, and then you lower the, the ramp, and you can just walk down the ramp 
in that formation, already protected, and not lose people. Now, it's implied throughout the movie that the Myrmidons and Achilles are the elite shock troops of the Greek army. Now, you just lost a bunch of men, and you're going to be losing a bunch of men completely unnecessarily uh, when they could easily, these deaths have could have been prevented. And they're dying before they even struck a single blow against the enemy. So it's not like they're, you know, trading like three, four, or five enemy dead for one of theirs. No, they're they're doing absolutely nothing. Also, when you jump, I this always bothered me too every time I saw this. You know, you're jumping, your plans to jump off what, like a 10 foot high, 12, uh, 15 foot high, you know, boat here. You're just begging for a twisted ankle, a broken leg. Um, you're off balance because you've got the heavy shield there and you're holding a spear and you're in armor. Uh, you're just begging for something to break or get strained or sprained in the middle of a battlefield, which is bad. That's really bad. Um, and you got these people, you know, here in over the water. Okay, the water may cushion their fall a little bit, but if there's like a pocket of deep water right there in armor, you're jumping in. Yeah, you run the risk of drowning. So, yeah, just ramps. <laughs> I just want to point out too that the arrows that they're shooting they don't even work in the logic of their own of the own movie because if you notice nothing's actually getting set on fire it's just an arrow that's just kind of smoldering there nothing's actually like like the boat's not going up in flames so really there's no point of of them doing so even within the context of its own movie so yeah i just yeah no more fire arrows i'm just yeah okay moving on <laughs> Ooh, right in the face. Now, see, if this was a standard Corinthian helmet, this guy would have probably survived. The cheek plate would have extended forward a bit more, and he probably would have lived. Smaller opening, more likely to survive a shot to the face. Now, again, there are open-faced helmets. They do exist. So, um, you know, they, they do have that same limitation. But uh, if you are going for a Corinthian helm, you, you know, the whole point of it is that it you gives you more face protection. So, um, yeah. The man wants to die. Okay, a um, couple things. First off, in the if you hear the um, the sound effects that are going on when they're in um, that that shield formation, you hear like a pinging noise. Uh, just you can listen to it. Uh, go back and listen to it. And I think there's going to be a little bit more of that. Um, that would imply very strongly that the well, the arrows are almost certainly bronzed tipped arrowhead there's been plenty of those that have been found and that would imply very strongly that the um the surface of the shields is also made of metal because there's like this metallic clanking noise which um i don't think the mycenaeans had bronze face shields like that they might have they might not have um i'm really not sure more than likely they did not uh, but okay fine in the logic of the movie they did okay um you'll also see though if um you take a look at it a number of the shields have arrows embedded in them. Now, the reason why they have these arrows embedded in them is would imply that it's something other than metal. Because metal on metal, like bronze on bronze, would um, the arrow would just bounce off. But it's bedding in there, so it's more likely made of wood or leather, uh, which is what historical shields were made out of. Of that, this time period, they'd either be made of goat hide or um, possibly even wicker. Uh, if you weave um, wicker strands or you know, something like that, like reeds or something like that. It actually is reasonably good material to make a shield out of, um, in which case it would embed itself in there. So that's a bit of inconsistency. It's like, you know, the arrows are acting like it's a soft material like wood, wicker, or leather, but at the same time, it's also, um, you know, you hear the pinging noise of metal on metal. So a bit inconsistent there. Now this shot right here, um, you got these guys hauling a cauldron up for no reason. Again, they could just be pour, pour, uh, pouring arrows directly onto the... Uh, the invading Greeks without uh, bothering to light them on fire, you know, just regular arrows like same people. Also, this should have been in place already. But then you got these a random cart and some of these stakes here. Now I'm going to presume that these are stakes that they you see them drive in there to, um, you know, give them some cover. It's kind of like a medieval version, uh, not medieval, uh, Bronze Age version of barbed wire. Which, um, okay, that makes sense. But they should have already been in place. Like they look, they knew the Greeks were coming. They knew they were coming. Like you know for presumably weeks if not months at this point what are you having them stacked up already this should already have been in place creating a hedgerow of um spikes for them to 
for the Greeks to deal with. Uh, whoever's in charge of the beast defenses, uh, you really need to get fired. You see the pinging noise, and you also got um, you know, arrows embedded in the shields. So yeah, that's what I was talking about. Oh my, come on! Okay, now, um, they're charging from the Testudo Formation. Now, in Warfare, Formation is 100% the key. If you break Formation, that makes you extremely vulnerable, especially this type of Warfare. Um, your shield is there to protect the person next to you, and um, by breaking Formation and Achilles right here, he's dropping his shield. Uh, you're basically begging to take an arrow to the face or to somewhere. You know, you're no longer under protection. You should have stayed in Formation until you get right up to the um, Trojans, and then you can possibly, you know, go from Testudo into something like a line formation. And the Myrmidons here, they seem to be very well trained, so it shouldn't be that difficult to do so. You, you know, the, the lines, you know, the guys in the rear just sort of drop back, lower your shields instead of having the roof over your head. Because uh, Testudo doesn't really work that well in close combat, but um, yeah. Um, yeah, d don't break formation and then charge out. It just is, you're begging to die. Okay, nice shield bash. I like that. Um, shields were a very commonly, you know, they weren't just for defense. You could commonly, you know, use them to bash the person with. And um, yeah, no problem there. Very cool. Okay, now he was impaled on one of his own spikes right here. Like one of the hedgerows of the spikes that were driven in. Why are you standing in front of that? You're, the whole point of these things is that you stand behind it. And then use this as a barrier between you and the oncoming enemy. It's kind of like putting a machine gun nest and then putting barbed wire behind it. It just makes no sense. You want to put the enemy in front of it, let them get tangled trying to navigate their way around it. And then while they're trying to navigate through these spikes or the barbed wire or whatever it is, you pick them off with, you know, with your ranged stuff like your arrows, your javelins, or your machine gun. You don't stand, you know, you don't put it behind it, behind you. Also, um, the Trojan breastplates here, um, they all have this type of armor here, this very similar looking thing. It looks to be metal. I don't know if bronze, first off, these would be massively expensive to have, uh, you know, everybody equipped with uh, this type of armor here. Uh, I'm going to presume this is bronze. Um, it would be massively expensive. And um, what is it? it? It's It wouldn't just, like, get, basically just falling, like getting smashed and then falling on one of these spikes wouldn't impale all the way through like that. I it, this is It's going through it like tissue paper. Yeah, it would, it, bronze, it depends on how thick the bronze is, of course, but I'm, you know, they seem fairly thick. Uh, it, it would be way more protective than that. Nice shield bash again. I'm really liking that they're, um, you know, using more than just their weapons. I mean, um, they do have other, you know, the shield, and um, you're going to see some, like, punches and kicks and elbows and stuff like that. You know, that's perfectly viable as well. Okay, now, um, small thing here. This is um, Agamemnon. Well, Agamemnon's right here. And these are the troops that Agamemnon is bringing directly. And they all are wearing the same equipment. And um, the Myrmidons all have the same equipment. The Trojans all have the same equipment. And, um, you know, every Greek faction and Trojan faction, everybody has basically a uniform. Now, uniforms wouldn't come around till the um, 1600s, thereabouts. And um, during the Trojan War, if we use the Iliad as any sort of example, there was no uniform. Everybody was more than happy to use the uh, armor and equipment of their fallen enemies. For example, um, you know, famously, Patrocles, or Patroclus, or however you pronounce his name, when he was killed by Hector, Hector was more than happy to use his armor. Well, actually, it was Achilles' armor, and, you know, how that worked out. But, um, yeah, there seemed to be no particular issue with doing so. So there's no particular uniforms... Um, they, they wouldn't have uniforms like this. Given the battle, 
will take the war. Give him too many battles and the men will forget who's king. Okay, now I really like this scene because what it does is it fleshes out um, the rivalry between Agamemnon and Achilles. Uh, in the Iliad, the rivalry begins when Agamemnon stole Briseis from Achilles and as a war prize. And it was basically Achilles' pride that was hurt that he had something, basically what he considered to be his property, taken from him by Agamemnon. In the movie, it's established that the two don't like each other right from the beginning and that uh, basically Achilles feels that he's doing all the work and Agamemnon's reaping all the glory. And Agamemnon just despises Achilles because of his arrogant attitude and just generally, you know, their clash of personalities right there. Um, and this scene, this um, really does show the help flesh that out there. It wasn't in the original cut, I don't think. So, um, yeah, it really just... Um, you know, fleshes out that uh, he's worried about, basically Agamemnon's worried about power and glory, and um, he's basically afraid that Achilles is going to steal the show from him. Very nice. Also, here's Menelaus right here. Uh, Menelaus, as far as I remember, he would have had his own force, so there's why would he be on Ag one of Agamemnon's ships? He should have some of his own to lead. And he doesn't say anything in this scene anyway, so there's really no point in him being here. Also, I have no idea. This is made out of cloth or something like that. I mean, like, dude, you're a king. You can you can definitely afford some bronze, you know, something better than this. Nestor's there. He's awesome. I think these are made of, they look like tiles. I think they're, these are made from bone. And yes, they actually, or um, possibly tusk. They're, and definitely there were helmets from the Mycenaean period that were made out of tusk and bone. I think boar's tusk specifically, there's a helmet that was found. And, um... Yeah, it's a nice touch. But then again, you guys are also kings. You should be, you know, Nestor and um, Agamemnon. You're king. You've got all three of you. You're kings. Um, you can afford the bronze stuff. And you're the, especially Agamemnon, you're the king of kings. You're you're the head, the high king, you know. Get some good stuff here. All right, so you got uh, Ajax here. Actually, let me get a better shot of him. Right there. Okay, now um, here's Ajax, another king. Um, first off, I really like this character. He's one of my favorite characters in the movie. Um, but uh, what is his armor? I don't. It's made of. It looks like it's made of leather of some kind. Okay. Um, and most of his chest is exposed, his arms are completely exposed, his shoulders are completely exposed, his head is completely exposed, he has no helmet on, and they've established that you can have helmets on in this movie, like the hero, you know, like Achilles, it's, you have, there are helmets that are open enough that you can see the actor's face and you know who it is we're dealing with here, that's why heroes generally don't have these things in movies, because you, um... You know, you want to be able to see the actor's face. So you can have, like, an open-faced helmet or some kind of headgear, more than just his headband. And he's just completely exposed here all the way around. Dude, again, you're a king. You can look the part. I guess they want to show off, like, his, you know, just size and, um, you know, just basically his physicality here. So I'm sure that that was for the storytelling element of it. And, um, yeah, it just doesn't make sense practically, though. Yes, use of rocks and improvised weapons, absolutely 100% um, accurate. Uh, happened with the Spartans at Thermopylae. After a couple days of fighting, their weapons were broken, their armor was, you know, in pieces, and they were basically resorting to using rocks and tree branches and whatever else they can get their hands on and fighting tooth and nail that way. So, yeah, very cool. It, these, this type of fighting would be just absolutely brutal like that, and uh, that really shows it. So, very nice. <laughs> When the winged hussars arrive. <laughs> All right, you got Ajax with his ridiculously impractical armor here. You have a two-handed sledgehammer, which I've never seen or heard of the Mycenaeans using warhammers in any capacity. Now, the Egyptians did have a mace. Um, they did use maces, but they were small one-handed things with a stone, um, attached to a wooden shaft. 
Um, big hammers like this, I've never seen or heard of, and this is apparently a stone tied on to a basically a, a shaft. Um, I that I'm pretty sure that never existed. And again, it's a two-handed thing that he's using one-handed. It's, again, it's just to show the sheer size and physicality of it. Ajax was the most powerful Greek after Agamemnon in the Iliad. So they're using this more as a way to show the contrast between um, him and Achilles. You know, you got Achilles, very fluid movements, very lightning fast, rapid strikes, whereas he's just a bruiser. He's just going to show up and just start smashing people apart. There's no style. There's no subtlety there. He's just going to start smashing things. Now, his shield here, I do really like his shield. This is um, a tower shield that would, was common type that was used during that era. And Ajax in the Iliad famously used one. It stopped a spear throw that was launched at him from uh, by Hector. And the seventh, it was seven layers thick, and the seventh layer actually stopped it from penetrating all the way through. And he pretty much was one of the better defensive fighters of the Greeks. And he basically held off the entire Trojan army by himself when they were trying to burn the ships. And also it was used as a pavis, basically um, a screen that his half-brother, Tusher, uh, who was an archer, he would, you know, duck behind it and then um, lean out or, you know, step up over it or something like that. Fire off a few arrows. Yes, I know you don't fire arrows, but whatever. Um, shoot off a couple arrows and then duck behind it for cover. So, uh, yeah, big tower shoes like this, they absolutely do have it. This appears to be made out of metal. More than likely, like I said, they would be made of wicker and goat hide. Uh, but, yeah, very cool. Did like it. This guy's having a very bad day. Those men down there need help. Now, touch on with me. Um, Warhammers like that would do that kind of damage, except they're ridiculously slow. So uh, again, there's really no reason for them to uh, to exist. Again, they're just showing here how basically this guy's an absolute bruiser. I am Ajax, breaker of stones. Look upon me and despair. Okay, uh, that little monologue from Ajax that actually might seem out of place. Okay, here you are in the middle of a battlefield and you're talking, look at me, look upon my works, ye mighty in despair. Yes, that's an Ozymandias joke. It's a, yeah, whatever. Um, they actually, if you go to the Iliad, they would do that. Sometimes their speeches in the middle of battle would be paragraphs long where they give their entire life story and life history. So that's actually pretty restrained on Ajax's part. And actually, it's a pretty nice touch and adds to the Homeric feel the epic feel of what's going on here makes perfect sense um yeah okay pretty cool out comes the swords um why he didn't just you know pull the spe spears are superior to swords in most ways um you have the extra reach why he decided to switch over i have no idea but okay fine he's achilles he can do whatever he wants <laughs> Yes, target the weak areas. Don't go for the armor. Go right for the weak areas. You know, the neck exposed thing. Slash at it. Done. Nice. <laughs> and he stabs a guy in the middle of a breastplate. And you see it's um folding over on itself like it's made out of cloth and just, you know, painted and dyed to look like it's metal. But, okay, fine. <laughs> Okay, now, um, in this sequence of events, what happened was um, he slashed at a guy, killed him, and then the second person, he just kind of, like, you know, pushed the guy to the side and then slashed at his back fairly lightly with his sword, and uh, that apparently killed the guy. Um, I don't think a, a light little slash like that on your back would be that fatal. Um, and then, of course, he spins the shield around and catches an arrow. Now, did he know the arrow was coming, in which case he has eyes in the back of his head, or he's clairvoyant? Or he was swinging it behind his back anyway for no reason whatsoever, and he just got lucky. Now, if he just got lucky, um, why are you swinging the thing behind your back anyway? Like, why would you do that? I mean, you know, shields are meant to be put between you and your enemy. If you don't know if the enemy's behind you, why would you do that? But, you know, it looks cool, I guess. 
Okay, there he is grabbing the spear. That's actually a very good technique. Uh, if you have um, a range disadvantage, for example, you got a, a sword here, and he's got a spear. The spear's got the range advantage. You grab the spear, and you pull the head offline so it's not going to stab you, and then you can close the distance relatively quickly and, uh, and dispatch your opponent. So, yeah, grabbing your opponent's weapon is a perfectly viable thing to do, and I approve of it. Very nice. <laughs> Okay, there's uh, Achilles' trademark jump attack. Um, again, all you have to do with a jump attack, because you're pretty much you're stuck on your trajectory on your way down. All you have to do is either move out of the way if you're the victim of this, or put your shield up between you and him, or just stab upwards as he's falling down. Because he doesn't have a shield in front of him, so you know he could have easily been stabbed um, as you know pretty much mid-flight. But uh, yeah, that's kind of his thing, and that's actually why Hector survived because he tried this against Hector in the final fight. Spoiler alert. Um, well, it's not the final fight, but whatever. Um, and Hector actually thought, oh yeah, maybe I should put my shield between me and the big sharp raining death thing that's coming down from above, which is why Hector lasted longer than anyone else. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Dual wielding. Okay, so what he, did, what he did right there with this guy here, pushed the shield off. He, the guy was blocking with shield. Good idea. Um, he push, pushed the shield offline. Now, he did it with a sword. I don't think a sword would have enough impact to be able to do that. But okay, the idea works. You push the shield offline with one arm, you know, one one weapon, and then you slash with the other one. That is, that's really good. Okay, yeah. Get rid of your opponent's defenses first. A quick one, too. Nice. <laughs> Little bit of grappling there, very nice. Spinning. Okay, and you got this guy here. He just embedded. Yeah, the um, the sword was embedded in this guy's helmet. Again, presuming that this is made of metal, uh, made of bronze, and the sword was made of bronze. There's no way it would pierce that, and no way it would then pierce into the skull and basically embed itself in the skull. I mean. This is made of tissue paper in this guy's skull. Uh, the guy needs to, like, drink some milk and get some calcium in his diet. I mean, you know, it just simply would not have done that. I mean, I guess it shows the dem demonstrates Achilles just raw power. But then again, this is, um, you know, this is supposed to be a low-powered version of Achilles. Like, there's no gods, no goddesses. Um, he's not a superhero, anything like that. It's just, you know, these are normal people. And so a normal person simply would not be able to do that. All right, so that's just my uh, very pedantic look at the opening battle for Troy. Um, hope you found it interesting and entertaining. Uh, just, you know, this is really, again, just more to test the software that I had. So uh, just see if it works out and check out how it interacts with the microphone and everything else. Um, yes, I was super pedantic about it, but you know what? I It's just how I am, people. Um, any case, if you enjoy this, uh, please hit the like and subscribe button. Send this to your friends. Send it to your enemies, too. I don't care. I'm not going to judge, you know, one way or another. Um, send it to whoever you want, really. I, I don't care. Um, more videos from me will be coming out whenever I get around to it. Uh, please hit the subscribe button, too. It doesn't cost anything. Look, I'm a cheap bastard. I fully understand you don't want to pay for things. I don't like paying for things either, but, you know, uh, help me out here. It's... It's free. It costs you absolutely nothing. Come on. It's right there. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Right. Have a good day. Or don't have a good day. You're adults. Have any kind of day you want. See you later.